Wild Strawberries is a film that takes us almost immediately deep into Bergman's psyche. He has said that the dreams and nightmares in it are all real. They are all experienced by him. He's one of those fortunate people who can remember their dreams. This opening nightmare, which when one sees it for the first time, has an incredibly physical, almost visceral impact, pays obvious tribute to the German silent cinema that Bergman admired very much. Stuffed with symbols, lit by Gunnar Fischer in a glaring, stark, black and white manner that just wouldn't work in colour, and filmed entirely on the back lot of the so-called Film Town, the studios owned by Svensk Film Industry, just outside Stockholm, where the street was recreated. The sequence suggests, I think, one of the most frightening realities of our dream world, that is, seeing ourselves. The cliché goes that if you see yourself in a dream, you're going to die. Most of the time, of course, you don't. You yourself are the protagonist in the dream. Everything happens to you. You regard the action. You are the viewer, as it were, of your dreams. And this sequence not only works in its own right as a perfect example of Grand Guignol, rather like the opening flashback in Sawdust and Tinsel, but also as a foretaste of what will happen during the rest of the film. Bergman's intense dislike of sunlight has often prompted him to use harsh, glaring whites in sequences like this, and indeed the opening of Sawdust and Tinsel. Now, part of this sequence was shot in the old town of Stockholm, at dawn so that there would be no public walking around the streets. And the special effects people at Svensk in the 50s created a kind of balloon-like model stuffed with blood that would collapse on impact with the sidewalk. This is an effect that Bergman uses in The Seventh Seal, too, where Gunnar Björnstrand taps a prior on the shoulder in the beginning of the film, and it turns around and it's a skull. Here, the figure is a harbinger of the death that Isak Borg knows he must face, but also, of course, a reminder that in order to purge himself before achieving serenity, he has to make a journey into his past. Bergman chose the name Isak Borg very easily. The initials, I.B., are his own, Ingmar Bergman, but they also stand for Is, ice, and Borg, which is an old Swedish word for fortress, ice fortress. In other words, the personality that resolutely refuses to confront emotions. There's a nice nod here to the phantom carriage, which Sjöström had directed in the early 20s, and which also dealt with death and redemption. Here, when the wheel crashes into the lamppost, we have a wonderful use of sound because the sequence has been so silent, apart from these sudden moments of high drama. And now the squeaking and squealing of the coffin, seeking to break free of its moorings, reminds one of a baby also. In an act of parturition, the coffin will slither out of the carriage like an infant emerging from its mother. This contains the real nub of the movie, the struggle between the dead and the living and the need to escape from the fear of death in order to live in some kind of fulfilment. Now we come to the climax of the dream, when Isak approaches the coffin. He's almost mesmerised, compelled to do so, and will, of course, pull his own body up towards himself. Note how Bergman uses the rich black of the clothes and of certain backgrounds in this sequence. So good on DVD, actually. As he gets closer and closer to his image, so Isak will awake at dawn in consternation. 